What's up, sports fans? Welcome to this week's edition of EBC Sports International. Here's what we have for you this week. Golden State Warriors fan base Dub Nation shares thoughts on the move to Chase Center. In NCAA football, Notre Dame sacks the victory over Iowa in Camping World Bowl. Then Alabama squeezes a win in the Citrus Bowl out of Michigan. We also have news from the NHL in Las Vegas where the Golden Knights hosted the Philadelphia Flyers. And then we head to Vancouver where the Canucks keep their win streak alive against the Chicago Blackhawks. Hey everybody, I'm Michael Hudson coming to you from Seattle, Washington. Welcome to another episode of EBC Sports International. First and foremost, Happy New Year to all of our viewers around the world and thank you for joining us for the first episode of the new decade. Since the new year is all about changing for the better, we'll start with this episode with our Las Vegas correspondent, Aljamin Santos, and hear what the Golden State Warriors have to say about their new move to the Chase Center. Let's check it out. Since the Golden State Warriors run in the finals last year, the dynasty has been dealing with injuries and recoveries. And just recently, namely the fan base, Dub Nation, has been witnessing the rise and fall of the team yet again. Let's hear what Dub Nation has to say about the move from Oracle Arena to the Chase Center. So now that the Warriors are here in San Francisco, um, how does the move to San Francisco away from Oakland affected you as a fan? Uh, the commute's a lot longer. Um, you got to kind of just pay for a hotel when you come out here. Um, it's, yeah, it's just like a whole different atmosphere too. It's like a different, a whole different like uh, atmosphere here. So, uh, is this your first time here at the Chase Center? Yeah, uh, it's the first time here. Yeah. Uh, how do you like it better over here in San Francisco, if you do like it better, uh, in comparison to being at the Oracle? I'd say the arena's a lot nicer. Um, everything's like a lot cleaner, everything runs pretty smoothly compared to the Coliseum. Uh, that's that's uh, definitely plus. So I know the team is very young and it's still early in the season, but looking to the future, who would you want to see uh, in a Warriors jersey? Uh, I mean, I'd like to see LeBron James come over at, you know, at the twilight of his career. You know, <laughs> that'd be kind of cool. <laughs> Has the move from the Oracle to the Chase Center affected you as a fan and why? Uh, actually, it has uh, just a longer distance for me. That's all it is. But I appreciate everything that's here. So you said this is their first time here at the Chase Center. Uh, what is it that you like more about the Chase Center or better uh, in comparison to the Oracle? I like it because it's all, it's all, everything's open and stuff, so that's what I like about it, and it's bigger. The Golden State Warriors have earned many accolades in their name, championships, and as individuals have broken many records. What goes on in their head as they revisit another rebuilding process? Damon, over here, uh, Algernon Santos with Eagle News. Um, I know the timing of everything with um, personnel change, new teammates, uh, new, new arena to play in. How much of a morale hit do you think? the team is taking with all the changes happening all at once? I think our morale is still great. Um, I think our execution to be hit, but our, our team morale is still the same morale you watch when we won championship. That don't change. It's a culture that you build. Um, just because you're losing games, you just don't go by the wayside. Like, you build that for the last for years. Uh, so our morale is still great. The Golden State Dynasty has a lot of work to do, but there's no doubt that the motivation to get back to their championship form remains. And since the move to the Chase Center doesn't seem to bother their fans, it won't be long till it's just as loud with their cheers. From San Francisco, California, I'm Algerman Santos for Eagle News, always one with 25. Oh man, it's great to hear the embrace of change coming from both fan bases and players like Draymond Green, who share the same thought as well. It's inspiring to hear that championship mentality never leaves through any storm. Thanks, Algernon. We leave the NBA and head to Florida to hear about how Notre Dame's defensive stance held off Iowa in the Camping World Bowl. Our Florida correspondent, Melissa Potes, delivers a story. Blue 42, set, hut! As the 2019 College Bowl season is well underway, 15th ranked Notre Dame faced off against Iowa State in their first ever meeting at the Camping World Bowl held in Orlando, Florida. In its largest attendance since 2016, 46,948 fans packed into Camping World Stadium to catch the action. Highlighted by Notre Dame's big plays and Iowa State's inability to score touchdowns would pave the way for Notre Dame's 33-9 win. 
Nerves might have gotten the better of Iowa State early on, as two costly fumbles would lead to scores by Notre Dame. The first fumble came after Iowa State held Notre Dame to a three and out on their first possession. On the ensuing punt return, wide receiver Tariq Milton fumbled the ball which was recovered by game MVP wide receiver Chase Claypool at Iowa State's 42-yard line. I was happy we were able to put some on the board right after that turnover and then continue that on. And you know, the defense kept giving us good field position, uh, good confidence, because you know, once we get a lead, then you know we can start opening up our playbook a little bit. Claypool would finish the game with seven receptions for 146 yards, one touchdown, and one fumble recovery. On Iowa State's very next possession, linebacker Jeremiah Awusu Koromoa strip sacked quarterback Brock Purdy and recovered the fumble. This led to Notre Dame's first touchdown when quarterback Ian Book hooked up with Claypool for a 24-yard reception. Notre Dame would end the quarter with a 10-0 lead. Iowa State finally settled down in the second quarter and would move the ball effectively, getting within striking distance of the end zone. However, they were never able to punch it in, having to settle for two field goals. After halftime, the game couldn't have started off any worse for Iowa State. After going four and out on their first possession, they were rocked by another big play when running back Tony Jones Jr. took Notre Dame's first possession to the house on an 84-yard touchdown run, the longest in both Notre Dame's bowl and Camping World bowl history. It was the culmination of putting together a running plan that, uh, you know, when you see it hit and then you see him, you know, go the distance because he's been talked about as, you know, a guy that doesn't have the ability to, you know, uh, take you over the top. But you saw him today um, break down the sideline and, and, and have the longest run in Notre Dame Bowl uh, history as well. Notre Dame's stingy defense, led by Owosu Koromoa, would hold Iowa State to one more field goal for the remainder of the game. Owosu Koromoa would finish with seven tackles, two assists, three sacks, four tackles for a loss, one forced fumble, and one fumble recovery. He's just an explosive football player, I think. But you can see his physical ability is real, uh, his suddenness, um, he's a you know, you you got to factor him in when when you're you're game planning. Iowa State head coach Matt Campbell wished a few plays would have gone in their favor, but he couldn't be prouder of his team. Obviously, there's about seven or eight plays in this football game that really dictated the outcome of the football game in some ways for us that allowed us to be inefficient. And unfortunately, that's. It's really what's held us back at times this football season from becoming the team that we do have the ability to become. But the character, the passion, um, the love of this senior class, what these young men have taught us and given to this football team has been some great lessons that we'll be able to carry forward in a really powerful way. The defensive performance when you, when you hold a, an offense uh, that put 40 points on a team that's playing in the playoffs in Oklahoma to no touchdowns, um, you know, you can't hide from that. Just did an outstanding job today. I thought our special teams was, was, was outstanding. And then offensively, um, you know, we ran the ball effectively, um, play action pass, uh, spread the field around. It was a comprehensive um, uh, game plan, um, and all three phases shown, shown themselves very well today. Reporting to you from Camping World Stadium in Orlando, Florida, I'm Melissa Potas, always one with 25. This year's Citrus Bowl was the fifth ever meeting of the universities of Alabama and Michigan and the most watched bowl game since 2010. We'll stay with Melissa and hear from special guest AP Stedham for their post-game commentary. We're here at Camping World Stadium where the University of Alabama just defeated the University of Michigan in this year's Citrus Bowl. I'm here with AP Stedham who has been living Alabama football for more than half a century and has been reporting on Alabama football for about 10 years now. He is the radio guest expert with Voice America Sports and WHEP out of Foley, Alabama, the home of Julio Jones and Ken Stabler. And he's also a Heisman Memorial Trophy voter. Thank you, AP, for being with us here today. Hey, Melissa, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So we're really interested in your insights on Alabama football. So can you tell us what your overall thoughts on today's game are? 
Yeah, Alabama had the better talent than Michigan, but they had a very good game plan. The Wolverines moved the ball effectively. They confused Alabama's defense, and they scored the first touchdown. And, and you didn't think that Alabama was ready to play, but they came back and tied it up, and it was a tight halftime, 16-14. Uh, to 14, The Wolverines led, and Alabama's offense came alive in the second half with uh, Mac Jones thrown for over 300 yards, and Jerry Judy, the former Belitnikoff Award winner, having over 200 yards. His first career game, over 200 yards, Melissa. And so uh, Najee Harris, the outstanding running back from Antioch, California, had his uh, 136 yards. I think that was the seventh game of the season for him. So he was dominant in the second half, and the tide held down for the victory, 35 to 16. But I thought Michigan was undersized on the on the front, and uh, Alabama took advantage in the second half. And it's just very difficult to guard those four receivers, the three juniors for Alabama, and, and Jalen Waddle, and you just can't corral all of them at once. Now, what adjustments did Alabama make coming into the second half? Um, to hold off Michigan? I think they did a better job defensively analyzing the plays. I mean, they looked lost in the first half. They were missing many, many tackles. Uh, I think it was the poorest game they played all season trying to tackle ball carriers and wide receivers. And there was some misdirection plays that they did not diagnose in the first half. But they played much better defensively up front. Uh, Michigan had, I think, 122 yards the first half rushing. I think they ended up with maybe 135 or 140, so they shut down the run. Then when you become one-dimensional, it's more easy and, uh, to guard the people and, and effectively stop their offense. And what are your, or who stood out to you offensively and defensively today? Yeah, well, for Alabama, it was Jerry Judy with the 200 plus yards. He's just so difficult to guard. Once he gets the football, then you're trying to tackle him, so he makes yards after the catch. I mean, he ended up with that 200 yards. And then Najee Harris, he's six foot three, 230 pounds. He can run over you, he can run by you, he can cut by you. And then Matt Jones was cool in the pocket, threw for over 300 yards. You know, he was the second string quarterback before Tua Tungavailo was injured, but he had another outstanding game. I voted for Jerry Judy and Mac Jones for the MVP. I should have thrown in Najee as well. <laughs> and defensively, I think the uh, backfield for uh, Alabama came alive. Josh Job was replacing Trayvon Diggs, who, who chose to uh, forego his last game as a senior at Alabama, and along with Terrell Lewis, the outstanding linebacker. So I think the secondary uh, played well, and then the defensive front seven played much better in the second half with their tackling and diagnosing the plays. And what does Alabama have to do to get back to the playoffs next year? Well, offensively, they seem to have found ways to score a lot of points with the passing game, and there's some balance with the running game as well. And they use the tight end. Um, Miller Forstall had come back from an injury. He had a touchdown today. I was happy for him. Uh, they have to become better on defense and figure out these, these offenses where there's receivers going every direction. Quarterbacks are so proficient with their passing and, and effectiveness and efficiency and accuracy. So I think uh, Coach Saban, I'd say they have to streamline that defense and not make it so complicated because they recruit the, the best players in the country, some of them, they're fast, and I think they get slowed down sometime by trying to uh, utilize all these various plays on defense. And then finally, you know, everyone's asking about Tua. What's he going to do next year? Does he come back to Alabama or does he go into the draft? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think Tua, he doesn't have much to prove on the field. We know he has poise in the pocket, extremely accurate, and, and he throws with anticipation, can elude uh, the uh, rush. He, he's the best quarterback I've seen at Alabama in 50 years of watching them. He's as good as anybody who played that position for the Crimson and White. His issue is injuries. So what's best for him? Should he stay out and maybe be drafted in the supplemental draft, which is after the draft in April? Should he just stay out the whole year and come back for the 2021 draft but really not play college football? I mean, that's the decision his family will have to make. Uh, but I think... Personally, I think maybe the supplemental draft might be the best decision for him because then he can work out for the teams. He'll be healthy at that point. They can't make a real decision about Tua and his injury. The doctors will have to give a preliminary diagnosis without really knowing if he's healed. Thank you. Thank you so much for your insight, AP. Reporting to you from Camping World Stadium, I'm Melissa Potes with AP Stedham, not always one with 25. When we come back, we hit the ice for some news from the NHL in Las Vegas where the Golden Knights fly into 2020 against the Philadelphia Flyers. And the Vancouver Canucks continuous victory with their win over the Chicago Blackhawks. Don't go away, EBC Sports International will return in just a moment.
I'm Michael Hudson, broadcasting from Seattle, Washington. Thanks for tuning in. The Vegas Golden Knights look to start the new year off to a good start against the struggling Philadelphia Flyers. Las Vegas correspondent Brian Sunson has the story. Brian? With the first Vegas Golden Knights game of the year, VGK won 5-4 against the Philadelphia Flyers. With an electrifying crowd and a heart attack inducing last few minutes of the third period, there's a lot to unpack. So let's take a closer look at the game as we listen to the players and coach and what they have to say. Three goals were scored by the Vegas Golden Knights in the span of seven minutes in the first period, and Max Pacioretty scored two of these goals. Pacioretty is currently in consideration for his first All-Star appearance after a strong first half of the season, leading his team with 18 goals and 43 points. Pacioretty talks about his first possible All-Star appearance and what he feels about the All-Star break. More important than the All-Star selection? Uh, I don't know. I uh, learned more and more how to take care of my body and uh, that bye week there, uh, you know, it could be long if you don't handle it the right way. So uh, it's a slippery slope. You don't want to take too much time off, but you also don't want to wear yourself out. So, you know, really who knows what's best, but I think it's all in the head anyways. Uh, in the last few minutes of the third period, trailing 4-5, to five, the Philadelphia Flyers outnumbered the Vegas Golden Knights 6-3 to three players, and at this time the Golden Knights had two players in the penalty box. Multiple shots on goal saved by Marc-Andre Fleury and a blocked shot by Brady McNabb eventually led to time expiring and the Vegas Golden Knights eked out their first win of 2020. Marc-Andre Fleury talks about what led them to securing the win. Just, uh, I try to find a puck, right? And you know, they have guys all around you too, so if you can always pass a puck you know, to different guys. So uh, during this day, I would try to find other guys. Uh, I, it was just a good team effort. Yeah, the guys are fun. They very good, very tight. And very good blocks also, right? So uh, that's, that's what we got. A player that stood out to Coach Gallant was defenseman John Merrill, who to everyone's surprise played forward in tonight's game and succeeded. Merrill scored his first goal of the season and was a fan favorite for the night. I don't like seven. I don't like it to kick guys out of the game. So uh, when we knew we only had uh, you know 11 forwards back there, we said, you know what, why wouldn't we put him out there? And John, he said, you know, I can, he can skate, he goes to the net. And, I know a lot of defensemen that I put up there before in the past over my coaching career, they had, they enjoyed it because they get a chance to run some defensemen in the corner on the porch and it changes it up a little bit and you know Johnny's a solid player, he can skate and move the puck and I thought he did an outstanding job tonight, good for him. This was a great start of the year for the Vegas Golden Knights as they are now 23, 15 and 6 and Philadelphia sits at 22, 14 and 5 in the respective conference. Coming from outside the T-Mobile Arena, I'm Brian Sonson, always one. You're the man, Brian. The Golden Knights are looking to stay at the top of the division with that win and are looking great for contending in the upcoming postseason. We'll see what happens. We bring another fight on the ice from our British Columbia correspondent, Anthony Sevilla, where the Vancouver Canucks fight to keep their streak alive against the Chicago Blackhawks. Take it away, Anthony. Patrick Kane's two goals were not enough for the Chicago Blackhawks, as the Vancouver Canucks held on to the 7-5 win at Rogers Arena en route to their sixth straight victory. The Canucks prior to their six game run had lost three of their last five games, however have shown to have made the adjustments to continue their remarkable turnaround midway through the regular season. It was a high scoring back and forth game as both teams scored a combined six goals in just under nine minutes in the second period. There were lots of odd bounces that found the back of the net which resulted in four lead changes. Late in the third period, the Blackhawks tied the game 5-5 after Patrick Kane inked in his second goal of the game and silenced the crowd in Vancouver. Adam Gaudet put Vancouver up 6-5 with 421 left in the game and eventually led to a Bull Horvat empty netter to secure the Canucks win at home. We had a few few good shifts and then uh, you know they kind of had one that just uh, was an unfortunate goal and um, settled down and just stuck with it and didn't get down on ourselves. Um, still had half the game to play so we just uh, got back to the way we, we knew how to play. It's always fun playing in those games. You want to play um, you know in those games especially when you're on the, the winning side of it obviously but uh, you know, it felt like a playoff game out there and you know Towards the end of the stretch, you're going to feel like that a lot, and, and uh, it's always nice to win those. I guess they're relentless uh, when they gave up a goal. It seemed like they did a good job of forcing 
um, turnovers on four checks and stuff. So maybe uh, they do that pretty well. But um, yeah, and it's hard to say. I've been facing that much. Robin Leonard got the nod to start in net for the Blackhawks. Coming into the game, he had won the last six games as a starting goaltender. However, the six goals given up in the loss to Vancouver would be a season low for Leonard. The Blackhawks goaltender gave his thoughts after the game. I thought we deserved better. I mean, every goal was just, what was it, two tips, two off our own, own bodies. Uh, it just felt like everything they kind of threw to the net went their way. And it's tough because I felt like I made a lot of really good saves. Uh, felt like I felt good today and have to let in six goals. So it's frustrating. And uh, I thought, you know, Kaner and a few other guys really stepped up and we should have got a point out of this. But. You know, it's a good team over there, and we, you know, when you make some mistakes, the, it's just 5 5, it's tough, uh, four minutes left there. Um, but uh, we just got to recover, regroup, and hit the next one. Anthony Sevilla, Eagle News, always won with 25. You know, what? what is it about watching the celebration of another success that makes you just feel good? I don't know. Uh, thanks for the story, Anthony. And that's it for this edition of EBC Sports International. Be sure to join us for the next episode. Make sure to visit our websites at eaglenews.net and eaglenewslive.com. Also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash eaglenewsph. Thanks for watching. I'm Michael Hudson, and I'm one with 25.